Hi, my name is John Herbst. I'm the director of the DNU Patrizio Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. I have with me um, Anna Marie Bilt from the European Parliament and Gennady Gruzhenko, who works on humanitarian issues in the east of Ukraine. And we're here to talk about the awful humanitarian crisis that has erupted in Ukraine as a result of the Kremlin's aggressive war in the Donbass. Um, Anna Marie, Rhea, you, you know how Europe has paid so much attention to the refugee crisis from the Middle East. Yet, in fact, in Ukraine, there are 1.5 million internally displaced people and over 600,000 refugees because of the Kremlin war. What can you tell us about this? Well, in the European Parliament, we've been, uh, some of us, uh, very committed to put at the highest level on the political map the forgotten war. Uh, it is a, a, a war of aggression, as you say. It is an hybrid war which hits militarily. The ceasefire is constantly violated in the eastern Ukraine and Donbass and Luhansk. It is an economic war. It's a propaganda war. And it has uh, affected 3 million people that are now in need of humanitarian aid. Convoys still don't have access to the Donbass, humanitarian convoys. There are crimes and human rights violations that are constantly perpetrated. We have started in the European Parliament an ongoing regular meetings, uh, hearings, public hearings on the human rights violations, humanitarian situations, and also with Friends of Ukraine and in the Joint Commission for Ukraine. Uh, we are strong supporters of the right of the people of Ukraine to uh, decide on their own future. Why do you think that this awful humanitarian circumstance has not received attention, sufficient attention in Europe? No, it's a forgotten war, and we should be able to be multitaskers and deal with several crises at the same time. And one of the reasons is because Europe, unfortunately, is divided, and the war in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, has been kidnapped by the overall relationship between the European Union and Russia, where some member states feel that. Um, there's still a possibility to, to have some kind of uh, positive solution with Putin, while others consider that uh, uh, we need to see the deeds and the Minsk agreement that at the moment is basically going nowhere, implemented by the Kremlin. We need to see uh, that there is a respect of international law by the Kremlin, and we should not forget that there has been also an illegal annexation of the Crimea which is even more forgotten than the war in Ukraine, which is also unacceptable for Europe and should be. Thank you. Gennady, I know you've done some very interesting work on providing emergency uh, medical help, both in the areas occupied by the Russians in eastern Ukraine, as well as the adjoining areas in the rest of Ukraine. What can you tell us about this? Um, in fact, we work only in the territory controlled by the Ukrainian government, but with both people from the both sides of the front line. And now it's maybe most ambitious project, which took care about more than 10,000 people, both combatants and the civilians' populations. Last time we worked more and more with civilian populations. And I would like to thank our Western partners for support and for solidarity. I need to stress that we need more signs of this solidarity to not be forgotten war and forgotten conflict because what is happens and is happening in the eastern ukraine is a not only a war between ukraine and russia and pro-russia separatists that is war for some basic values which west civilization found on we, war, we fight, and we as a medic fight, for to human being will be in the center, in the focus of our attention, and to support it as the greatest and biggest values against the unhuman system, if you want. So we really, what we need, we need a solidarity, we need some help, and we need that the West remember that we could win this, uh, fight together or lost this fight together. Thank you. Concretely, there are two things we have to do to move forward with the association agreement, uh, which is a way for the, which has been chosen by the people of Ukraine freely. And we have to unlock the issue of the visa liberalization. And I would like to congratulate uh, Ukraine because they have achieved all the criteria in the roadmap. 
And this is a call to the Council to unlock the visa liberalization because we have to stick to our words. They fill the criteria, we have to give them the visa. Um, my understanding from talking with both Commission officials and mm. EEAS officials is that there's a great deal of sympathy for implementing the DCFTA, the, mm. the trade agreement, despite the problems with ratification, for example, in the Netherlands. Mm. And unless there's a clear block, implementation will proceed. We are implementing right. it at the moment, provisionally, and we need to solve positively as soon as possible. That requires leadership in the, le leadership in the Netherlands. Let's see what happens with the elections. There, it's uh, a lot of uncertainty at the moment, and we need to move forward with the visa, which is blocked in the Council. The Parliament is in favour. The Council, unfortunately, has not yet to move forward. Do you have a sense as to when that might happen, moving forward with visa liberalisation? It's happening right now. Negotiations are going on right now as we speak. Okay, but you don't want to put a date on that? Well, the date was last week and the Council has unfortunately not, uh, not adopted it. And uh, we were disappointed and we hope that uh, now the, the Slovak presidency will, will be able to uh, unlock it within the presidency. Oh, yes, that, that would be a very good thing. Ukraine does need a shot in the arm from the United States and the, and the EU. And we need to join forces across the Atlantic, of course. That's why our conference is very important with the Atlantic Council. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Gennady, uh, has it been hard to get cooperation across the line of contact? Because you say you are helping people who've been wounded in the, in the areas occupied by the Russians. In fact, from the very beginning, yes. Because we are people mostly from the central Ukraine and western Ukraine were treated as a, some a NATO agent. I remember our first mention two years ago. But after the medics, especially medics, treat the people with love, with good qualification, for free, that it is a couple of days enough to uh, breach this propaganda results, to, over, to reach the people on both sides. Beside, uh, despite of language, despite of religion, despite of some cultural difference, and despite of other things we divide today, because Ukraine is really a very diverse country, that is true. And I was really very satisfied when last month the people from the Lugansk crossed the line and uh, went to our doctors in Stanitsa Lugansk with the receipts uh, or written by the or doctors from the other uh, from, from the occupied territories. So, uh, started as a pure medical project, which supported first of all Ukrainian army, then civilians as well. We now uh, see the unpredictable result. We became a uh, very powerful reconciliation tool, because when the people from the both sides of this uh, front line see the love, help, support from the people who speak Ukraine and who was in their arms before the Banderovce, that's like a nationalist, uh, they became, just see the, the problems the same, basic problem for the people, for the human beings the same. They to try to, uh, they start to talk each other, they start to uh, share their problem to each other. And finally, a lot of people from the Eastern Ukraine came to the, our doctors to the different part of Ukraine. That's why we not just treat the bodies of the people, but we treat and the, their souls and really build up foundation for future Ukraine. Multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-language maybe, multicultural, multi-religion, but political, real political nation. There, there's no question that your efforts are having that important political effect. But I imagine these are not described in the media controlled by the authorities and the LNR and the DNR. That is a huge problem because, for example, in the Stanitsa Lugansk, when we are working, there is no Ukrainian channels, not means in the Ukrainian language, but uh, broadcasted from Ukrainian territory. But all channels, radio broadcasting, television broadcasting, from both Russia or the occupied territories. And that is a huge problem. Thankfully, Ukrainian people, uh, doesn't mean which language they speak, they 
believe more and more what they experience it, not just what they heard. And when they experience it, like human treatment, human relations with the people from the different side or opposite side of Ukraine, that's work very well and very effective. Thank you. Uh, actually, actually Anne-Marie, one, one more question for you. Isn't it true that the fact that Ukraine is taking care of its internally displaced people, mm -hmm. um, not maybe as well as they'd like, but taking care of it, they're not heading as refugees into Europe? which contributes to this crisis being a forgotten one. Well, there are, according to ECHO and to UNHCR, uh, about 1.8 million displaced people, but 1.8 also refugees to European Union countries. But it's definitely true that it doesn't have the same impact of the refugees coming from the south and risking their life in the Mediterranean. But it's not uh, in any way should take away our responsibility to treat any human being that is, has a right for asylum, or the right of international protection, or the need of humanitarian aid in the same way. The problem is we have a huge humanitarian aid from the European Union, but no access, right. because access is denied, which is a flagrant violation of the Geneva Convention, international sure. law, humanitarian uh, law, and, and that's not enough uh, at the attention of the people of Europe. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Gennady. Thank you. Thank you.